This is Jake Owen. I'm here uh, in the Serrano kitchen showing you guys how I made a couple beats and uh, stuff like that. Um, I got a couple, brought a couple of sessions with me. Um, first one I have is actually a new song I did for uh, the new album I did with Freeway, uh, Stimulus Package 2. Um, for those that don't know, we did Stimulus Package 1, I think in like 2008. So this has got to be one of the, the longest uh, time between part one and part two in history has been, <laughs> I guess, 15 years. Um, so yeah, anyways, I'll, uh, I'll show you guys some stuff I did on this one. Uh, first of all, the sample is by this group called um, Hijra. I might be mispronouncing that. It's H-I-J-R-A-H. Um, it's like a gospel record from Oakland um, that my boy um, John Skloot reissued on his label. Um, Key Systems, I think it is. Anyways, you guys should look that up. I think it's on Bandcamp, and there actually is like a record for it. Um, but it's like an amazing um, gospel album. It's an unreleased album, actually. Half of it is unreleased. So I actually end up sampling a song that was unreleased that he gave me. Um, and it's kind of interesting that I made this beat and gave it to Freeway because it's actually like a Muslim gospel record, which is pretty rare. I don't know if I've ever run across anything quite like this. Um, so I'll play you guys a song. It's the, the beat I did is pretty simple. It's like some chops, drum, 808. It's not a lot, but the sample was just so good I had to, I had to run with it. So this is the song Choices by Hijra. Ooh, come on. So there was like a lot of stuff to pick out of this. Uh, the sample was just spoke to me in a lot of ways. Um, the choice is up to you. So I put a bunch of different chops in. Let me see if you guys can. So it highlights. So these are the main ones, and then I grabbed some other parts from like in here to, to get some turnarounds. So with this, I started with kind of just a basic sequence um, off some of that stuff from the intro. Um, but you can see it move around. Oops. <sighs> Pro Tools. Pro Tools. All right, bear with me. We're having some technical issues. Then I went to this other part. Um, come on. Come on. Come on, Brotos, what are we doing? Um, all right, I'll show you the drum break. 
that I used on this. Uh, come on. It's funny, it's, it's kind of subtle, it's not really that loud in the beat, but it it just kind of brought like a different rhythm to it, so. Come on, Rock Tools, what are we doing? Getting a little glitchy on me. Um, let me try to run it again. And then I, you know, I copied the loop, obviously. And good. Yeah, maybe we should. Should we restart the computer? Like, what's what's the angle? I, f eh, yeah, I don't know. We can't go eighth inch out, huh? Isn't that what we're doing? No, we're t in the sound card. I think that's probably, it's, it's the way it's interaction with the sound card is. Yeah, maybe switch it. Maybe I'll, I'll, uh, we'll go eighth inch out. Yeah. Let me go out this, the, if, if I go out the speakers, let's just see what it, make sure it's not gonna have the same problem. Bear with us. You guys got any questions since I'm sitting here trying to load this up? Oh, that camera. Oh, I'm looking at the wrong place. You guys got any questions? Fire them away in the chat. Yeah, it seems to be working fine now. Is it? Yeah. What's the WL prediction on the Seahawks this year? <laughs> uh, I think they're going to be like 10 and 7 maybe. You know, a couple breaks might get 11 and 6 out of it. You need that. Yeah. It's all good, man. He's going to happen all the time. Some. Yeah. Uh, external headphones. Um, favorite artist to produce for? Um, you know, I don't. I don't know if I could say I even have a favorite at this point. Um, I would say the ones that let me actually produce them, because all. A lot of your favorite rappers aren't going let, to let, let me produce them. They just kind of want me to send them the beat and uh, just agree with whatever they do. So, yeah. See, now it's working. I think we're good. Yeah. All right, it's working now. Shit, we're back. We're back. Yeah. All right, it's working now. Shit, here we go. So I see one of the questions in here is what's my approach to chopping samples? And I think more than anything, it's just about doing what makes sense 
with whatever you're pulling up, whatever you're sampling. Um, something like this, I mean, this record was so good, I, I didn't really think I needed to put the loud drums on it and, and do all that. So I was kind of more laying in the cut with the production on this and uh, giving the rapper room to, uh, you know, do his part. But, you know, there's sometimes you can get lost in process and just be so impressed about what, what you did, like making a beat, that it doesn't necessarily equate to a good song. So I think over... Over the years, I'm always trying to find that balance because sometimes I want to impress myself with a beat I make, you know, and not necessarily just with a sample I pick. Um, this one, this is definitely one where I'm just trying to get out the way for sure. Um, let me play what Free did on it, actually. Steaming or it's freezing, we be grinding through four seasons. Summer, winter, fall, spring, the product be on time. You should serve them pieces, now it's 40k for the future. Move your bodies like telekinesis, a strong mind. Get ready for that scrutiny, you trying to be for the people. Folks say they bought that unity, but they all lying. Every day these people shooting shit, they ain't being peaceful. Trying to save our sick community, cause we all dying. We out Puerto Rico, ducking Ricos, we all mobbing. If I ever get cool by them people, I'm blowing trout. Plus, I told my mom and my aunties I never leave him Turn me to a savage Had to bury my own child Two times Them pa Made me a new guy Heart filled with pain Please keep me in your do eyes Even though I'm hurting Had to hit y'all with a new rhyme Want to get to heaven Trying to cash in my coupon So it's funny With pain I actually was there When he recorded this one And uh You know he's He's been through a lot of tragedy These last uh Three years or so, he lost both of his kids and his dad. So, I mean, yeah, it's, uh, it's heavy shit. And, you know, he, he was saying, you know, these things that were, you know, powerful to his life. And then he just, like, had dipped off and started talking about <laughs> spinning in the Bentley or something. And I had to tell him, like, nah, that's, that's not what we're going for on this. If you're going to hit the heart, you got to hit the heart. So... He switched this last line. I thought it was a perfect last line. So like that that's an example of like somebody actually letting me produce them. But honestly, I'm not always comfortable producing people either. If I don't have that relationship with them, maybe I can't tell them, tell the artist something that particular um, and feel comfortable doing it. Um, another guy that, for whatever reason, just listened to me was Nipsey. Like, he really wanted to, to get my opinion on things when we did a record. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily tell him, like, nah, that rhyme wasn't it. It would just be more like he would think, like, you, what do you hear on this? Should I add to this? Should I do another verse? Um, what do you think of this hook? Um, all the songs we did, you know, started off kind of real simple, like him just do a verse on a beat, and then we kind of built them out after that. Um, so I always, I always uh, you know, that always be a little more special than me than when I just sent a beat to somebody, even though I'm, that's all great with me too. I've been a part of some classics like that too. Um, this song is called Family Tree. Uh, we have the new album, Stimulus Package, coming. Stimulus Package 2 coming soon. Um, I can't say when because we're doing this ourselves. We don't really got a label. It's not that kind of situation. So all of it is just a learning experience for me. I have to like get outside of my just sitting in the studio um, thing and, and uh, play a bigger role on <laughs> all parts of it. So that's why it's kind of taking some time. But... Um, I think you guys are going to like it. I'm excited about it, and that's all I can really go off. Um, what else we got? What's some other questions? Throw me some more questions.
Oh, I have a question for you guys. How are you guys liking Serato, Serato Sample with the stems? Because I think it's amazing. And it's not because I'm in Serato right now. It's, <laughs> it is, it's changing lives out here. We're going to get some more publishing because we're going to get away with some things <laughs> that we couldn't have before. And I know you guys can feel that. We can all feel that. Um, I've even been trying to uh, tap into the Serato studio. I tried to make a beat on the plane the other day. Uh, and I'm, I could see how that could be pretty powerful. It kind of felt like what I think of like Fruity Loops being, but their version of it. Um, I have no idea what I'm doing on it, but I can make a couple of sequences, you know. My main DAW is Pro Tools. Um, and... You know, I get asked this question a lot, like, why do I still use Pro Tools? Um, I had somebody um, tell me that I'm a serial killer because I use Pro Tools to make beats on it. <laughs> Could be true. Um, I think, uh, you know, I, Pro Tools is the first digital anything I use as far as making beats. Like, before it was just ASR, EPS, all those kind of things. Um, and... I've just been using, I've probably been using Pro Tools since like 2006. So it's more just a, the element of not really trying to learn another thing and just kind of being used to the sound of it. I mean, I have done beats on Ableton. Like I did uh, Brent Fire's Rolling Stone on Ableton. Um, but I feel like for my hip hop stuff, I can't quite figure out how to get it to sound like me when I do beats on like Ableton or other DAWs, I think. Um, Pro Tools is just kind of like comfortable for me. Um, so yeah, it's it's been, uh, I can see myself switching. I feel like having a plug-in like the Serato thing where I can chop samples, I can kind of take that anywhere and probably get my thing together, you know? Let's see. Love the tracks you did with Mike and Keys on Formula One. Uh, will there be more collabs? Man, Mike and Keys are like, you know, that's family. Like we've done so many songs together um i love seeing what they do with like the loops i make um and we've we've hit on some big ones um and i just feel like they're always doing something different and creative than a lot of the producers when you give them loops they just kind of put drums on them and mike and keys will sometimes they'll play me a beat like uh there's a song we did uh for nip um, with Ross, I think it's called Mark My Words. Um, and I really had to, I, I had to make him pull, I had to make Mike pull up the the Reason session and solo the part where he used my sample because I didn't hear it at all. He could have totally got that one over. <laughs> I, mean, I wouldn't have known at all. Um, but they're just creative. They're really dope. Um, and, and they're just cool people. Man, Mike had, those guys had a studio with Nip, uh, for, for a long time and that's partly the reason that I was on had that many songs with Nip because I was just happened to be around when Tuxedo started happening I would come to LA and we were rehearsed for tour and stuff during the day and then I just wanted to get away from that and get back to hip hop so I would go to their studio we make joints and a lot of that that's what turned into you know these various songs for Nip and um, Buddy and you know other guys too um but yeah, those guys are amazing. I, I love those dudes. Am I still using ASR-10? Yeah, I definitely still use the ASR-10. I, it's been a minute since I made a full, full beat on there. Um, sometimes I'll just program a drum on there. I'll play um, bass on it or uh, use some of the effects. Uh, the other day I made a beat in the computer and I just felt like it wasn't um, tied together properly like sound wise, that's the thing with the, with the old gear, it kind of masks your faults sometimes where it'll, it'll glue the sounds together in a cool way. And so yeah, I, sometimes I'll run stuff I'm doing back through it. Um, but I mean, that's always gonna be part of me. I, I can use that thing without thinking about it because I just have so much experience with it, but yeah. Uh, da -da -da -da. What's your main source for samples? Um, man, I still go to record stores. I'm crazy, but that's just my thing, man. That's like the more money I make, the more success I have. I just, <laughs> I just buy more expensive records, man. That's what I'm into. It's what I love. I'm a collector. 
Um, a lot of these records I buy, I'm not necessarily even buying them to sample. I've just been af after them for so long. Um, I just got back from Japan. Um, Japan is record mecca. I mean, I spent way too much money. I mean, I, we always joke every time we go to Japan, we just basically give all the money back to the record stores, and that's pretty much what happened again. Um, I, you know, I'll listen to stuff on YouTube. I think YouTube is just an amazing resource to to come across all kind of music. So, like, I mean, you have to think. I started making beats in like '92 or '93. And I remember looking in the uh, liner notes of De La Soul is Dead. And I was I, one of the first albums where they listed the samples they used. And I remember they had, um, I can't remember if it was Biddies of the BK Lounge or one of those. It was like, contained sample by Lou Donaldson. Um, why can't I remember the song? Anyways, one of the, is it not, nah, is it, it might be Ode to Billy Joe. Is it that? Anyways. Uh, maybe it's your thing. Anyways, I I was like on a mission to find that record. I couldn't find the record. It wasn't anywhere to be found. I think I ended up hearing it from Supreme or something later. So, I mean, now that you can like skip all that and just go to Who Sampled and be like, oh, I wonder what Alchemist uses on this. Bam, it's there. That's amazing. I mean, it's bad for business, but it's amazing. Um, and it, you know, it can accelerate your learning curve, obviously. Um... Is there anything you haven't successfully sampled yet that you keep going back to? That's a really good question because I think with all these stem removal programs and stuff like that, it made me go back to things that I thought about in that way. Like, for instance, uh, I did a song on Freddie Gibbs' last album called Lobster Omelet with Ross. And... I used, when, when RX-7 and that stuff came out, which is a, another stem removing program, it was kind of the early versions of what we're doing now. I really went back to a lot of the records I started with and started running those, uh, those joints through it. And uh, for that one, I had like a Gene Harris record I got from my stepdad like in 1992. And it took till 2020, but I ended up making a beat out of it. So yeah, it's, it's never it's never too late. <laughs> Are we good? We good? Um, do you find yourself sampling over creating melodies from scratch more often, or do you go back and forth? Um, I would say for that one, um, I kind of just do one until I'm tired of it, and then I do the other. Um, there was definitely a point in my career I was tired of like all my publishing getting destroyed by samples, so I was like, man, I gotta, I gotta like control my own stuff. So that's when I started playing more things and coming up with original music, and then I, I ended up doing a lot of songs and had published on them. And then I was like, you know what? I don't care. I'm sampling flagrantly again until you know it bites you in the ass but that's i kind of just go back and forth with that stuff um it, it always makes it interesting you know and i think everything i do with sampling records informs what i what i'm playing because that's usually what i'm trying to do is just capture a sound or something i'd already liked all right so maybe i will pull up um, the beat that I did for the Serato video um, with Tony B stuff, which you guys got and you guys made lots of beats out of them. Um, I think it's this one right here. All right. We should have gave you Benji's drums, huh? Nah, that's, that's for me. Fuck that. <laughs> it's 
So yeah, you guys probably saw how I created this on the video, obviously. Um, used the two different samples, played some stuff. Um, how, how long do we have? Do I gotta start pulling up the beats? Okay, maybe we should start playing the beats then. Oh, you got, like, after that, after a half an hour, you can start playing the beats. Okay, okay, cool, cool. All right, so... Start from the beginning of this. Somebody was asking about, like, vintage synths and stuff. This was, a. Uh, some stuff I played off the chroma uh, on top of this original piece. And then, you know, it's just, that's the really cool thing with the sample is we can take, take the bass out of the original sample and play our own bass, you know? Um, it, gives, it gives you that space to do that. see the different chops here. I like it. I, I like going back and when you hear it with all the stuff and you realize this was just not possible before. And I, I think that is just a cool way to illustrate what this thing can do. Um, so yeah, that's that's Tony B sample, uh, the group Teleclear. It's actually an unreleased song that he had, um, and he actually told me the story about this song. That he went in the studio and made it all like by himself with two girls, like one night in the studio, and uh, then he recorded it and he was, you know, he listened to it like a week later and was like, he just thought like it was a waste of time. <laughs> which is crazy because it just you know you just never know stuff just finds its, its place but um tony b actually has a 45 from before this called um fantasy love that is super fire um it's it's a very uh it's a very hard record to find it's a 45 from seattle i happen to get my copy of it from um you guys know Master Ace is, the rapper Master Ace, Born to Roll, all that. Um, Master Ace had got a bunch of 45s in the early 90s from, um, from ASCAP. They had like basically just put them out in the street. And he knew somebody that worked at, you know, out in that building. So he goes and grabs, I don't know, like 545s. And he has them, you know, just he sampled them for various things. Um, but he gives them to my boy Marco Polo in like 2020 during COVID. He was like, maybe you should use some of these for, um, you know, for beats or whatever. Marco had posted one, a 45 from this batch of 45s on his Instagram story. And it was a really rare record. And I was like, where did you get that from? Cause he's not a record guy. You know what I mean? So like. And then he starts showing me some of the stuff that he got, and he told me his story, and I was like, oh, my God, <laughs> you hit a gold mine. Um, he had the craziest gathering of, like, rare local 45s from, like, mostly the mid-'70s or early-'80s. So then I was kind of just begging Marco, you know, to not let anybody else look at them because <laughs> I wanted to buy them. Um, so as soon as, uh, you know, 2021 hit, and we were able to travel again. That was the first place I went was to New York. And uh, 
I went and sat with him and bought a bunch of the records. And one of the records I bought was, was Tony B's record, Teleclear, um, Fantasy Love. Um, so it's, it's just crazy how, you know, this record's from Seattle. Tony B mails it to ASCAP in 81. Master Ace gets it in 90. And then I brought it back home. I brought it back to Seattle. <laughs> I love that part of it. Um, of course, Supreme already had the record. You know, he probably had 10 of them or something. That's what he does. Shout out to Supreme. Um, so, yeah, that, that was kind of like my first exposure to his, uh, you know, Tony B's like funk music. I didn't know he, you know, I, I knew him as a radio personality in Seattle. So it's like really shocking to me that he had made a joint like that that was so dope. Um, and, you know, Supreme put that, that on Weedle's Groove. Um, and even I, I found out recently there was another 45 that we were looking for back in the day called um, Black and White Affair. Had a breakbeat. It's more like a late 60s, like, sound like some Big Daddy Kane would rap on type stuff. Uh, more, more like that style of hip hop, like more b-boy. And I'd known about this 45 for a long time. And... Um, I happen to be talking to one of my neighbors who I grew up with and you know, he's, I'm, we're talking about like the music I'm doing and stuff like that. And he, he was like, you know, uh, you know, Emmanuel down the street that used to live down the street made a record in the seventies. I was like, what he did. And it happened to be that black and white affair record. So I feel like I was around it the whole time and didn't even know, you know, like people in, in England were paying like $500 for that record in the nineties. Uh, which was a crazy amount of money for a record at that point. Um, so yeah, Seattle, we got we got some cool we got some cool history with the funk music for sure and the soul music and jazz too, obviously too. Shout out Kenny G. Um, <laughs> shout out my boy Philip Wu. Probably not watching. Um, let's see what else you guys have to ask. All right, what is your process for clearing really obscure, unknown, rare samples? Um, you know, unfortunately with sampling, there is no exact process. Um, you're probably better off if it is something like a Teleclear because most likely the, the person who made that record still owns the rights to it. If it was like self-release, you know, they put it on their own label. Um, I mean, you really just got to contact the person. It's going to be easier than contacting Universal if they own it. That's for sure. So, you know, we have some cool resources out here for clearing samples. Like this track, track lib thing is amazing. Like that you can use something that they have and they have cool stuff on there and you're not giving up all the publishing or giving them 10 grand or whatever. That's, that is, that's revolutionary. I, that's going to change the game, I think. Um, so it's cool to see that happening and going that way because I think some of the big publishers have just gotten really out of control with the demands they have for um, stuff you sample. And I mean, I understand if we're talking about like you sample Led Zeppelin or something, that's like a legacy catalog thing or Michael or whatever it is. But, you know, if we're talking about something that's kind of undiscovered, we need to meet in the middle a little more for sure. All right, so we got the music part, the drums, which is crucial. What's what's kind of funny about these drums is initially when I made the beat, I used the drums from the beat I played before on the freeway beat. So I didn't want to use those again for this beat. So I had Benji play drums at um, Soundview Analog and come up with something kind of similar to that. If I could ABM, you could probably see what I'm talking about, but. Um, I got a bunch of bunch of drum breaks I made with Benji now. I'm probably we're gonna probably gonna put out a pack of that stuff um, soon. Hopefully, got to go back in and do some more stuff. But definitely keep an eye out for that. But yeah, there's there's a lot of stuff in here. It's just kind of like. 
I, when I make beats like this, I try to layer it all together where it kind of all sounds like the sample. Um, that's the goal when I'm doing this kind of beat, for sure. So yeah, it's kind of like a, you know, it's kind of how the beat goes. It's not really that much to it. Um, oh shit, I see my boy DiBiase on here. He's a he's a beast with every DAW, uh, all these different samplers and stuff. He's making beats on calculators, man. He's he's super ill. Um, who else we got on here? Yeah, Philip Wu, who I was talking about earlier, is uh, from my neighborhood too. He's the keyboard player for Roy Ayers, um, played on Everybody Loves the Sunshine, uh, all the Roy Ayers stuff from like I think 74 or 75 to about 80. And then he joined this other group, you might have heard of them, they're called Maze, M A Z E. They have this song called Before I Let Go. That's him playing keys on there. So yeah. From from my neighborhood. I, I I didn't even know about this till maybe seven, eight years ago. So it's it's crazy to think like, you know, these guys came before us and did it so much bigger. Um but yeah, Philip now lives in uh Tokyo and he's playing in bands and stuff still. Um and he you know, he they had a benefit for his like uh high school music teacher mentor dude in Seattle and he had all his guys he played with, uh, I think at Franklin back in the day, and they sounded great. I, I wanted to record them and sample that, so never really lost it. Maybe we'll start pulling up some of the beats for uh, from this contest. Should do that. Let me find them. Toronto, just kitchen. All right. So I'm not the one to pick these beats. Let's be clear on that. <laughs> but they did pick 10 beats for us to go through and listen to, uh, you know, they were all flipping the same stuff from Weedle's Groove. Um, and there is some sort of prize. Um, what was the prize again? I just wrote in the chat. Yes. Okay. Uh oh, sweet water. Anybody, anybody get a? Uh... <laughs> no, I'm not gonna do it. <laughs> I'm not gonna do it. Um... Oh man, yeah. <laughs> so we got ten beats. Uh, let's let's play some of the beats. Uh, you guys can comment too. Um, the first beat is from DJ Stare. This is like it's a movie, so he's he made a movie and then it is a movie. Oh, you know what? Do I have to? I don't think we heard nothing there. Let's change the sound to external headphones. Bam! Bam! Are those the living proof drums? Hold up. Hold up. All right, let's play it again.
right, that was DJ Astaire. But I like that one. That was, um, it kind of sounded like, uh, it's definitely like 90s-ish. It sounded like the uh, the group home drums to me. Uh, is that Living Proof, I think? But I like I like the way the, uh, how the bass line was rolling underneath it um, from the chop and, and the turnaround he did. That was dope. I mean, he had scratches on there. It's great. Uh, next up, 33, Don Huey. Might be mispronouncing that, but... crazy arrangement. I was not expecting the 808 part to come in. That was wild. I love seeing how, how different these first two beats were. It's like, it's like they didn't even use the same thing. That was an actual movie. I'm going to give that movie status. Uh, all right. I know this guy, so I know this beat's going to be good because he's he's really good at making beats. Uh, this is a little homie from... He's not even little no more. He's probably old as shit. This is Trox. He's from Portland. Are you 40 now, Trox? <laughs> Maybe 30? Somewhere in the th late 30s somewhere? Yeah. All right.
that was dope. I really liked the little vocal thing he threw in there. That was nice. How you know, he stretched the kind of nonsense words. It wasn't really even a word. The little ooze or whatever that was. That's something I would do. Um, drums was dope. Some sort of breakbeat chop, I guess, you know. All right, next up, we got Solar. dope i really i like the way he played the bass on there that was that was interesting it was dope uh frillant frillant that's who's up next um let's let's play this one Dope too, man. You guys, you guys is playing some shit this week. Like the baseline on that one a lot, actually. Um, and even just the, the the bounce of it was dope. It all kind of made sense. Um, next up, we got Fourth Street Mega. <laughs>
was sick. That was way different too. Like I can hear um, one of those like funny Detroit rappers, like Baby Tron or one of those guys on that. Like it just sounds like something they would be on. Um, that was ill though. I, <laughs> I like that a lot. Uh, next up was Green Minds. different all the beats are. It's, it's really cool. Next up, we got DJ Gons. Oh shit, we got one of these, okay. that too. You guys are not making this easy. All right, next up, M Chop. Kiss the girls and make them cry. Kiss the girls and make them cry. That was the bounce right there. I like that. I like the little, uh, the high-low bass those. I love those. I love that kind of stuff. 
That was great. Last one we got is Brown Jewel. slap too all right we made an executive decision over here that we're gonna play everything so we got some more we got some more uh-oh all right well that's somebody's gonna have to claim it no not those what were the oh, it's called kitchen beats There we go. Damn, the reason, okay. Talon Beats. We don't know who this is, but you can claim it, I guess. Got there? Louder! Yeah. Well, clap your hands to what he's doing. Last call Last production. Call. Last call production. So we got the drop in there. That's Tina Marie, but I think he chopped it to say his name. That's pretty fire. <laughs> I was like, did you go AI for that? That's what I was thinking at first.
<laughs> That's clowning, dude. <laughs> I like that. I like that. get the joint and key we can't be playing it for that long all right all he wants to know Sends another one. Receive an airdrop. Downloads. Get added.
And then DJ Rentem Spoons? Rentems? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> Tim Spoons, that was dope too. Oh man, all these are really good. Oh man, I don't know. <laughs> I need the guidance, man. Shit. I'm trying to remember what stood out to me now. There's so many beats. Um, I guess that's why you guys don't play 20, huh? Uh, <laughs> oh shit. Um, we're picking three. I'm trying to remember what they all sounded like. Let me, can, can you load it up over there so I ain't gotta play it out loud? Oh, no, play it out loud again. Play oh, it yeah. Out all right. All right, what were the ones I liked the most? I remember Trox's. There was, there was a fast one I think was my favorite. It might have been this one. <laughs> That's definitely one of them. Gonzo's house. house. I feel like, man, I don't know house music to, to pick the house one. It was, sounded hella well done, though. You know what I mean? That's a tricky one. Uh, I like this one a lot. It's the girls and make them cry. It's like a bounce of this. This one had the little breakdown that was ill. Damn, man, this this is not really easy, is it? Um, hmm. I'm gonna pick this one for number one. I don't know. It just it just hit me different, and it, nothing else really sounded like that. So, Fourth Street Mega got number one to me. Um, number two. I mean, Trox, is he just good? Beats, man. I'm gonna give this number two. Uh, number three. Damn, I feel like there's a lot of these. They're all really good. Um, I'm not too familiar right now, so I can... That one's number three for me. Frylent. Frylent? Am I pronouncing it wrong? Yeah, Frylent. Frylent. So I got Fourth Street Mega number one, Trox number two, and Frylent number three. They're all good, though. This was not like a, you know was not an easy one, um, which is a good thing, for sure. So, the winner gets a $300 voucher from Sweetwater. With that voucher, after you get something, you might be getting some cold calls from them. (laughs) (laughs) 
Uh, second place gets two hundred dollars. Third place gets a hundred dollars. Uh, but yeah, all you guys are are good, man. I don't know. I, I love the variety in what you guys were doing. I thought that was really dope, really dope. Um, man, I, I'm I'll take some more questions if you guys got anything you want to ask me. Is Sweetwater gonna be on my ass now? <laughs> <laughs> they might give me some money. I'm tripping. What am I doing? Yeah. Uh, for me, when I start making a beat, the melody is way more important um, because I just feel like I can pull together some drums. I mean, on the real, there are many times I just import some drums I already did, and then I change something, and we get another beat with the same drums. Um, there's a bunch of songs that came out there like that. Like, Furthest Thing was probably the first time I made that pattern, and then when I did Loaded Basses for Nipsey, I think I just imported those drums, and it was the tempo was half, so it just made it a different beat, and I moved it around to make it make sense. So for me, I think... Uh, yeah, the melodies. It's harder to get a good melody for me. Cool, I got some more. Um, do you find you're often drawn to a specific, like specific chord progressions, or what draws you to specific progression? I find myself sampling the same ass chord progression all the time, and I kind of <laughs> hate it. I really kind of hate it. I feel like the last ten years I've been making the same beat and using the same chord progression, but it's just, I don't know. It's what speaks to me. Um, I don't really know, I don't know if that's just I have limited musical palette sometimes or whatever, but yeah, for sure. And I, I don't even know exactly, which is probably a lot of seventh chords and stuff like that, you know? Um, Gons had a question for you. Okay. They said, when doing the music under Tuxedo, what was the production set that came from it? Man, with Tuxedo, um, I feel like it leaked into my hip hop a lot because it just, I was, I was playing bass lines different for that. And I, I feel like I found a way to imp implement that in more hip hop -y stuff. Um, I mean, I would say the big thing for, with Tuxedo is I had never made beats fast. Um, every beat I made was like 90 something at the most. So to have a song 118, 120, um, finding, finding uh, things to make it not feel as fast to me. So maybe less hi-hats, um, maybe not as much notes in a bass line or, you know, spacing them out. Um, that was something I really got from there. And just being with, with a singer, I learned a lot of stuff about um, structure melodies and, uh, you know, creating space for vocals, you know, because when you're kind of making beats, you're not really thinking about that. So I might make a rough beat for Tuxedo and then Mayor might be like, we gotta take all this shit out of here. I just want the bass line and the chords. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, also, on that, actually, last call asked, like, what's your favorite gear for good bass lines? Um, that changes. I mean, there's there's a bass sound that I sampled, like, just off a, a real bass note that I played on everything for the last 10 years um, that I sampled into the ASR. That's my main hip hop one I've used. Um, tuxedo is a lot of memory moog. Um, but I did get my Juno back this year after not having it for a long time, and I've been using that a lot. Um, Juno 6, right? Juno 6. Juno 6. Yeah. Um, I've been using that a lot, but I feel like I'm starting to play that out, so i got to switch it up again. <laughs> yeah. Um, then um, when, when you're listening to music, is it with a specific point of view, for example, do you listen out purposely to find an intro, a hook, a bridge, et cetera, or in mind, does it... Kind of jump out you as part of the process. Um, when I'm listening to music to sample, I'm just looking for a spark, something to get the thing going. Um, and sometimes that could be something just as simple as listening to like a record and hearing two chords, and then I'll go figure out those two chords and play that, and make my own idea, or you know I'm gonna sample it um, and go from there. But yeah, it's, 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 I try to also just not always listen to music just to, <laughs> for samples. It's hard, it's, it's hard to like appreciate it sometimes. You're just going through them too fast. So 
I listen to most of my music just driving around because I'm that way I can't stop and make a beat. It's like more of a, you know, I get to fully absorb the whole record. Mm -hmm. On that, actually, how much of creating for you now is through like random moments of inspiration as opposed to working on something you've kind of myth myth methodically planned out? I don't think I've planned barely anything out, man. I think I just get up there and do it. Um, and I know when I catch something, I think that's my biggest skill is I just have the ear to know something's like good enough to continue on with and when to quit, you know, I'll, ju I'll jump out and turn the thing off if I don't like it. Um, yeah, I mean, once we have a song, you know, then I'll be like, okay, I need to put another part here. There needs to be something else that happens here. But like just making pre-production beats, I don't really look at it that way. It's just more something to spark an idea. And then, um, anyone else in the chat here? How did you adjust to becoming a touring, art touring artist and playing live? Um, that was a big shock to my system for sure. Um, I'm not like a classically trained keyboard player. So just having to get up on stage <laughs> in front of that many people, um, and play the right notes was uh, was definitely terrifying at first. But, you know, sometimes they throw you in the fire and it works out. It made me a lot better, I think, just in all facets of being a musician, making beats, all of it. Um, but I, I will say touring, it's, it's cool. I mean, it's the shows are fun, but, you know, I think it's, it can be overrated sometimes as far as everybody thinks it's just like a big party, but it's really a lot of waiting around and then hurry up and do it, and then on to the next city. So the the thing you get when you do a show, especially for a good amount of people, is you just get that interaction off something you made is just crazy. Like when I make a beat for somebody, even if I, you know, like I went to um, J. Cole's show, I think it was last year or year before, and he did uh, My Life, and it was crazy to see like an arena sing along to a song that I made. That's, that's only happened a couple of times for me, but... Still, I wouldn't say it necessarily felt better than being on stage for a thousand people doing my own songs. It's, 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 it doesn't feel as personal. You know, when you're up there, if you fail, it's on you, you know. <laughs> and even as a producer, when I produce somebody's record, if nobody likes it, I'm just like, well, shit, that's on them. I, I did my thing, you know, on to the next. When it's, when it's your own music that you're the front thing for, you just take it a lot. It's a lot more personal for whatever reason. Um, DB had a question about how did you do that breakdown on the Dread Soul? Right? Um, man, I just did that on the ASR10, just messing around one day. I don't, I don't, you know. Initially, during that time, was when everybody started kind of doing those uh, intros, like uh, something like what we do. Like they have the at the beginning of the song, it'd be like a boom, 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 boom. You know, I just did something like that, and I don't know what made me think to move the tempo up and down. It just I did it one time and I was like, ah, oh, that's kind of cool. I'll put it on the B tape like that. <laughs> Don't bring out there today. Ooh, oh, he's on the camera. <laughs> he's on the camera. Don't do that. Um, all right. Um, well, speaking of the MF Doom joint, you got yeah. like all these joints on your YouTube channel, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, what, what, what are the, some of the favorite beats you've, you've broken down? You've done, what, the Rick Ross joint? Yeah, I've done I've done a bunch of Rick Ross ones. Um, I did some Nipsey ones. I did J. Cole. I did, man, I mean, a lot of them. Larry June, um, Chance the Rapper. Um, yeah, I haven't done one in a little bit, but I'm trying to find some of the older discs of the stuff I did in the early 2000s, but some of them, they're on floppy disk, and it might have, like, three discs to it, and I can only find two of them, you know? So... But yeah, the the behind the beats thing's been cool. It's I didn't realize I was branding myself when I was doing it, so it's been cool to see like the younger generation um, even know what I do or you know know about me because of that. You know. Are you gonna do another snare Jordan pack? Man, I, I I have I have a bunch of that stuff uh, set up. I just haven't <laughs> just haven't dropped. I've been lazy. Well, I shouldn't say that. This last month I've been going flying crazy been working a lot but uh yeah maybe maybe later in the year I'll, I'll get another snare jordan out um let's see is trap door with mf doom a sample bass that is definitely a sample bass guitar and uh, organ um 
I did that in New York uh, with G. Coop, who ended up being a superstar in his own right. He produced um, Bad and Bougie for the Migos. He produced Is a Vibe for um, Two Chains, right? Two Chains. Oh, yeah. And a bunch of other people was on that song. Um, G. Coop was one of my musician guys I was working with, and he was the first guy I was really around that. I'd be like, I want to sell like Isaac Hayes guitar off Walk On By, and he could do that, you know? So he just, he was just really great at that. Um, so when I was working, I was working in New York for like three months in the G Unit days, and I had him come out to New York, and we made the original idea for Trapdoor at um, Emil's studio. Emil used to have a nice studio in New York. And I did that and a bunch of other stuff with, with uh, G Coop in that era, like in, in a week or so. Um, but yeah, Trapdoor is a great record. I mean, I, I think I did like six or seven songs for Doom. I got unreleased stuff with him, you know, maybe it will come out one day. It's, it's not up to me, you know, when unfortunately when somebody passes like that, and it's the same thing with Nip, it's just kind of like, I just, I'm hands off. Let, I let the, the family and the estate kind of decide if they want people to hear it or any of that. I'm not the one. You know, I'd feel crazy even trying to turn it into something for me. So it's it's all it's a weird it's just a weird situation. Just people that I knew, and I wouldn't say I was that close to Doom, but you know, I worked with them a lot, and even Nip, who I was definitely closer to, just seeing them not be around to accept all this adulation from the fans and everybody's so interested, and it just it just feels weird to me. I don't know. I I just keep thinking about them not being here every time I see you know I. I drive in Seattle and I see these electrical boxes with like, you know, one of them has Nipsey on them, one of them has Doom, another one has John Moore, who's one another good friend of mine. And it's just, it's crazy that's just, that's how they exist to us now, you know. Well, shoot, man, I think we should probably wrap it up. Okay. Um, do you want to say shout out to the winners and where people can find you and stuff? Or like uh, man, I'm Jake Uno on a bunch of stuff, Instagram and Twitter. Um, I don't got TikTok. Maybe one day I might be too old for TikTok. Um, I saw. I saw. Is Mike? So Mike and Keys are coming on here. Oh, I don't know. Anik's trying to line it up. Uh, okay, Mike and Keys. They they're gonna get busy for sure. Mike and Keys, and there's two of them, so they don't have an excuse not to get busy. <laughs> Somebody better be good that day. Uh, and they're in LA. Come on. Yeah, anyone want to shout out or anything? I mean, shout out to everybody, you know, that, that got me here. Every, you know, the Cut Corners, Sunny, uh, D-Struck, you know, everybody that's, that's part of the Serato team, thanks for doing this video. Uh, you know, got me looking good. Everybody's excited and impressed by it. My parents like it. Um, you know, it's, it's all love. Big Up Undercut. Oh, yeah, big, big Up, up undercut. undercut. All right, let's, uh, let's wrap it up, man. Thank you.